Yeah. You know, the, can you hear it different? What's he doing different? I'd be really impressed if you could figure you know, what, what's the difference in sound? The first one was you know dum 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 da ba da ya ba dum 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 da ba da da ba dum da ba dum bum 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 bum. Second was yum dum 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 da ba da ya ba dum 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 da ba da ya ba dum da ba dum dum dim bum bum. What's the difference? They weren't like not sharp. Yeah, sharp. Yeah, go ahead. What were you gonna say? For some reason, I thought they weren't using the bows when they were. Playing like the violin and the oh, they were yeah. That would have been that would have been really cool. But yeah, but no, but it's it's important and interesting that you thought that. And it's not correct, but there's a reason for thinking that because it's shorter, right? The sound was clipped. It's more exciting. It's more it's more tense, right? And I think it's like Perlman is one of the best violinists in the world. The guy that's about ready to play the solo part. Um, very interesting guy, by the way. As if you don't know, it's like Perlman. Perlman, as in Pearl Edmund. Um, he's, uh, he had polio as a boy, um, has very, very big fingers, very wide fingers, and so that he plays the violin at all is amazing, and that he's one of the best in the world is even more amazing. He probably plays with more passion and feeling than 99% of the uh, violinists out there, and I mean now 90% because everybody's copying him. And, um, but, uh, and, um, the story about, I like the story about how he met his wife. He was doing a concert someplace in his 30s someplace. And um, this woman who was a violinist, a professional violinist, went backstage and asked him to marry her. And he did. So, <laughs> I kind of like that. But anyway, that's, that's utterly beside the point. I think it's not the Al Apollo and Daphne story at all. But anyway. <coughs> so, um, okay. Now, what's the equivalent? I'm going to start from the beginning. And what's the equivalent in this piece of the light and the dark? And I'll try and clip it for you so that you get the sense. What is the, the um, Baroque antithesis that you feel in this style? <clears throat> But now we just heard another antithesis, another typical Baroque antithesis, in which this piece, this type of form was invented. We'll talk about that in the Baroque period in just a minute. I split that sentence up into, in a very nasty way. But anyway, so what was the other antithesis? We had loud, soft, loud, soft, right? The orchestra, the entire orchestra was playing. And then and then the, 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 the second phrase, loud and then soft. And then what happened? What was the next and um, Stark contrast. You'll get it. This orchestra song. And now what happens? How does it change? You can see it by looking. What's, what's not happening right now? Just, that's the solo. Just two, these two guys, right? These two guys are playing all by themselves. 
right? So first of all, you get the big instruments, and then you get the small instruments, and you get the big instruments, and you get the small instruments, right? I mean, the, the, and the, the group as a whole is called tutti. You know, from, from International House of Pancakes, they used to have tutti frutti pancakes, which is all fruits. Um, tutti means all. It means everybody plays, okay? So tutti is the orchestra. And you have the soloists. Now, this, um, and in this case there are two soloists, actually there's one official soloist, and then the first violinist, the guy from the orchestra, also picks up a solo line, and then they play against each other. So you got these two soloists playing against each other. There's an antithesis within the antithesis, right? But anyway, this form of a, of a, a piece, of a composition in which you've got this stark contrast between the group as a whole and the solo instruments is called, in the Baroque period, a concerto grosso. <coughs> okay? Now, the Four Seasons, this is spring of the Four Seasons, and these, these sounds that you're hearing are also representing things. I'm going to ignore that for the moment. The doodle -doodle -dee, doodle -doodle -dee. We're actually birdies, right? And that's kind of cute. And it's fun, but I'd like to focus, for you to focus right now, just on the sound, just on the musical aspect of it. Because the music in and of itself is interesting enough. And then later on you're going to get a murmuring stream, and you can look that all up, it's all on the, on, the, um, on the listening guide. But for us now, I think, to build your listening skills, let's just listen to the music as it's constructed. Because that's actually as interesting to me, actually more interesting than the things that they represent. But you can do that too. Uh, for now, um, I'm going to show you, as we're going to go through the whole thing now, and I'm going to show you as we walk through it, the louds and the softs, those typical antithesis, like the light and the dark, and the break between the group as a whole and the soloists. And you're going to find at the climax of the piece, this relationship between the tutti, the, soloist, the, the group as a whole, and the individual sound of the instruments, Remember, that's analogous to society as a whole and the individual. Remember that, that, that relationship we've seen so many times, right? And in Baroque music, you feel it kind of, you hear it, sort of, right? You hear an individual voice, and you hear a collective voice. And that echoes the way we live, right? We live as individuals, and we live as a, we are a group. And we, are, and we walk out of this room and we are no longer a group, we are individuals. Right? And we go back and forth between these two roles all the time in our lives. So it's part of our lives, and what music often does is it makes us hear things, even unconsciously. Even if we're not aware of it, it's there. So, but when we get to the climax, this relationship between the group as a whole and the soloist is going to get more and more dramatic because the, dis the distance between them is going to get so sh shorter and shorter. And you're going to feel the climax. It's built to develop that relationship into a climax. And I'll show you how that works in a moment, okay? And you'll see it, I hope. Um, so here we go from the beginning, and I'll just walk through the, the Baroque antithesis as we hear them. This is 
section of the babbling brook if you're interested. Too deep loud. of that relationship between the solo and the, and the orchestra as a whole. If that isn't Baroque, nothing is, right? Concerto Grosso. Now we're going to listen to another Concerto Grosso, but it's a late style. And you're going to see uh, that the relationship between the, the, the orchestra as a whole and the soloist is still there. It's still Baroque. And there's still a kind of, you know, I would say, uh, it's not exactly an antithesis anymore, though. It's as if the solo hands off to the orchestra, the orchestra hands off to the solo. But let's look at that first in art, where the same thing, and I, I use a similar theme of men and women, again, in a late Baroque style, this time by Peter Paul Rubens, if I can find him. Come on. Oh. All right. Now, you might say this is very similar, right? The women are running away from two men. Uh, the story is Castor and Pollux, again from Greece, uh, needed some wives, so they took some, right? And uh, to make a long story short, um, uh, they were successful. And they became their wives, actually. Um, but of course, against their will, or so it seems, right? Um, now, that would be typically Baroque. We still have this antithesis. We still have this kind of contradiction. We still have this eroticism on the one hand, and this, um, this repulsion, this revulsion, this actually almost violence on the other, right? But in this case, in their late Baroque style, it's not quite that simple. Because uh, in, with Daphne and Apollo, Daphne made it away, right? It was an absolute break. She turned into a tree. I mean, she really did you know, what she needed to do to get out. In this case, A, it's not successful, but we don't know that from, at this moment yet. But if we look at this moment, is there anything about... I don't think we need my name up there. Wait, <laughs> I'm not sure I can get rid of it. Is there anything about... The, the posture or the way this thing is projected that tells you I don't know if I can get this looking at it. Um, how do I do this? Just double click on it? I'm afraid to do that for fear. No, that's not working. Well, all right. You can see it, I guess, right? Uh, that the, the attempt to escape is not quite as absolute as it was in the Daphne and Apollo story. Anyone know what I'm looking at? Look at the woman on the bottom. Imagine you were in her position. I mean, physically. Now, he's got her his hand under her arm here. Um, if she were desperately trying to escape, what would she do? You're seeing it, right? 
Yeah. How? Just just say it. So, yeah, you just throw her weight in the other direction, right? Her arm is up this way. All she has to do is throw this arm back around this way, and her weight will take her onto the ground. And she's off running. It's not that simple, right? She's kind of protesting and kind of not. Right? She's keeping her weight here, and yet complain. Uh, uh, you see the problem? And here too. Now this is, she's caught a little bit more. She's kind of in the grasp. I'm not sure it's that easy for her to physically get away. But there's something about this expression which is a little bit, oh, woe is me. Right? <laughs> you see what I mean? A typical game, you know, so to speak, as if, um, oh, you know, alas, I guess I'm being carried away, you know, something like that. Um, I know in these troubled times in the United States right now, this is a this is a tricky theme. So we have to be, you know, we have to be sensitive to that as well. But in the Baroque period, this was this was kind of now it was kind of exciting, right? So despite the fact that there's still this Baroque antithesis, it's clear. I mean, there's <laughs> there's a German a German comedian who um, did a, a skit on this once, and he was asking. Uh, how did it go? Somebody was, he was, oh, there was a, it was a, a psychologist asking his patients, saying, okay, you know, because they were having, I guess it was a, a, a marital conflict or something. They said, okay, what's going on in this thing? And the, the man says, well, the men are, help, are giving writing lessons to the women, <laughs> or something like that. I guess it's really not all that funny. But okay, <laughs> um, so, so this, so, there's another little hint here, by the way. What the heck is this thing doing here? <laughs> Who is it? Cupid. Cupid. And Cupid is the god of love. And well, even more than love, uh, the Greeks made a distinction, as did the Romans, between love and sexual attraction. So this is the god of Eros. Eros, Eros or Cupid are the same. And Aphrodite and Venus were the god of love, as in, you know, I love toothy bright toothpaste and my father. And this is the god of Eros, which is sexual attraction, which is you know, a little little more risque, right? What's he doing? I don't know if you can see it. Can you, can you imagine? He's hanging on to the horse. He's hanging on to the, exactly, he's hanging on to the reins. The reins go from here through his end. So Cupid is hanging on to the reins. In other words, he's helping. <laughs> Nasty, right? Um, so, I mean, it's cute for if, given the... But, of course, this risque and this, the, the tension and the ambiguity which is even an ambiguity today, especially today in this country, is what Re Peter Paul Rubens is playing with. That's the, the Flemish painter, Peter Paul Rubens. It's a later painting. It's a, it's a painting in which these antitheses in the Baroque period became less of, a, less of a dilemma and more of an interesting, fascinating, even exciting mystery. It's still a mystery. It's still a question mark all of these relationships. How do, and of course men and women are always a question mark, but that, I mean, in, in terms of religion and, and science, and all these things have not gone away. They haven't been resolved. But we're getting used to them and we're feeling it differently. And we feel it differently in the music as well. So when Johann Sebastian Bach gets a hold of the Concerto Grosso form, what he does with it is very different feeling than what Antonio Vivaldi just did with it in the Four Seasons. And I'd like to play for you the Brandenburg Concerto Number no. Five. The Brandenburg Concerto and it was written in Brandenburg, the city of Brandenburg, where the, the um, Prussian king had his court. Bach was a church musician, and he was applying for a job. I think this was the occasion that he was applying for a job with the king, and he didn't get it. But <laughs> but um, uh, this is one of the pieces that he played with the, at the king's court, and that's why it's Brandenburg, where the king had his court. Um, Concerto Number no. Five, the first movement. And um, I'll just play a little bit of it, give you an impression. You can say whatever comes to mind, really, and feel free to just say what, what you feel about it. And then we'll take a closer look with the technique and say what's happening to the Baroque antitheses and what's happening to the Concerto Grosso. Please memorize, Concerto Grosso is a composition which is structured on the relationship between a soloist and the 2D. Um, the, 
that relationship between the, the orchestra as a whole, the group sound, and the individual sound. Sometimes, as you heard before, it's a couple soloists. You'll hear that here, too. Okay, Brandenburg concerto number five, Johann Sebastian Bach. <coughs> This is what it would have looked like at the time. This is a Baroque castle or palace that they're playing in. In fact, I've been in this one. <laughs> How is this different from the early Baroque Concerto Grosso? You can see it's a Concerto Grosso, right? You can see it physically by the two, the flutes um, up in front, the flute and violin in the front, and the, and the big orchestra in the back. Um, but how is the, how's the structure different? How does the music flow differently? They continue to play louder. Yeah, they just keep going, 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 right? So um, is this loud, soft, loud, soft there at all? A little yeah. bit, right? But it almost, it's almost flowing into each other as to be almost indistinguishable, right? It's like, it's still built on that idea, but somehow the individual instruments, and it's partly because when the flute and uh, violin are playing by themselves, the cellos keep going. So there's always this bottom there, and then one, you know, I'll st uh, if I'm the flute player, I'll start a melody and I'll hand it off to you, you're the violinist, and you're going to hand it off to the group and they'll pick it up and not even finish it and somebody else will come in and sometimes I'm accompanying you and sometimes you're accompanying me and sometimes we're all playing accompaniment together before the next melt. In other words, it's all sort of interwoven, right? And that's a different way of approaching all this, right? And that happened in religion, it happened in science, it happened in politics, it happened in art, it happened, as we saw with, the, with Peter Paul Rubens, it happened everywhere. But in music, the concerto grossa becomes what <laughs> What a, a classmate of mine in Germany once said is, I don't know if I can translate it, in ein anderer hervorweben. It was an in, in, into each other and forthweavery. <laughs> There's no word for that. He made one word out of it. He just invented the word. I thought it was pretty cool, but that's what is happening. It's all sort of going like this, right? Like a spaghetti of, of sounds. And um, the other Baroque thing that has taken over here, <coughs> which people were afraid of, so to speak, at least when they looked at the universe at the beginning of the Baroque, is motion. You could feel, you mentioned it, right? This constant motion. What Newton and Galileo discovered in science, music has picked up in music and played with. And this thing only stops for a phrase once. In Vivaldi, it stopped every 10 seconds. Yum dum dum da ka da ya ka dum 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 da ka da ya ka dum da ka dum 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 stop dum 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 da ka da dum 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 da ka da ya ka dum da ka dum 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 stop dum da ka dum da 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 stop right it stops once here and then doesn't stop for another four and a half minutes 
throughout the whole thing, and I'll show you where it is. Stop. And that's the last stop in the piece. Actually, it's two of these. I can't do it very well. And then after that stop, nobody ends a phrase. Even when that phrase comes up again later on, it goes, yum, da 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 Somebody else picks up that note and runs with it so that the phrase can't end. In other words, what, what we discovered in science is now becoming sound. And we're playing with it. It's not, it's, not, it's not something to be avoided. We've figured out how to make constant motion exciting and work musically. That couldn't have been done before. Actually, that's not entirely true. The Renaissance did that to some extent, too, but in a different way. OK, so I'm going to, I'll let you listen to, do we have time? Oh, yeah. Um, and then we only have one more piece, actually. And um, you know, we're done for today. So, um, so this is. Uh, run the brick and share number five, first movement. There are three movements in these things, but we're just going to do one. <coughs> listen for that first stop, and then listen how the instruments hand off to each other, how they don't let any phrase end, what the Germans called, oh, that's a nice German word, by the way. <coughs> not, not that guy that my friend came up with, but this is an official German word. You don't even have to know German to understand it, right? Fortspinnung. You can guess what it means. It's a spinning forth. <laughs> it's a thing that just keeps spinning forth. Right? It never stops. Okay, here we go.
probably the best harpsichord solo in the literature grows out of this thing.
it's still awake? Mm -hmm. Hang in there. There's one more piece, and um, this one's, I think, shorter. But, and it's built, um, now that, those were two Concerto Grosso's, right? The Concerto <coughs> Grosso from early style, Concerto Grosso from late style. And um, this, this idea of Fortspinnung is very clearly evident here. There's another kind of Fortspinnung in a new form that's coming up more and more in the late Baroque style, and that's called a fugue. Um, a fugue is based on uh, a melody that starts out, in the case of this fugue we're going to hear, it sounds like this. That's the melody, okay? And um, so it's just this basic, and it's just really the, 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 the triad, and the, the basic notes of the scale. That would be the key we're in, it's in G minor. <coughs> so it starts out with those, and you're going to hear, when you hear the melody come in, it's going to sound like that. Okay? Okay? Now, what a fugue does, is it's, a, it's another example of Fortspinnung, but what happens instead of like this, where the solo maybe comes in with the same melody, um, a little bit differently, this one, the, the, the main melody plays out in one hand of the organ, let's say. You can do it also with an orchestra. And then the, the, another instrument or another hand in the organ picks it up and plays it in a different, um, a different place. Like, let's forget where it is. Instead of, it's, right, it's in a different, and then what happens is those two start playing against each other, right? And while, while this new melody comes in, I forget what this one is doing, it's going, playing some little doodles around, right? So, um, so what we, we call this melody, the main melody, we call it the subject in a fugue, right? This is a fugue style. And, um, and then there's a counter subject, which is when it comes in somewhere else, right? And there, at one point it gets so complicated that we have this feeling that we need I mean, just the typical Baroque question, where do we find order? Where do we find a sense of gravity in all this motion? And there's one really interesting thing that happens in a, in a fugue, and that's called a pedal point. And it's called a pedal point because very often, not always, but very often it's actually played with the pedals. An organ, has anyone, has anyone seen an organ played? An organ has at least two um, uh, uh, keyboards but can have as many as six or eight in the really modern organs, like, you know, run on top of each other. And each one is, is tuned to a different set of sounds, of instruments. It's, it's designed to sort of echo the orchestra, but also sound like a pipe, right? And so, and not only do they have all these, in, these keyboards that you can play in various ways to get different sounds, but your feet play the really big ones. And so there's a keyboard on the floor, which really big notes, each note is about this long, and you play those, it's just like a keyboard, and you play it with your feet. Oh yeah, you had a video on... Yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to play right now, that's that same video. It's pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. It's great fun. It's also like driving a 12, you know, wheeler semi instead of a, the Prius that I have. I mean, it takes a lot of practice. Um, but, so, um, and that pedal point, oh, I forgot to explain what a pedal point. A pedal point is just one note. In, in the pedal, while everything else is going, this one note is there, and sometimes it fits the harmony, and sometimes it doesn't. But it's drawing, drawing all this the spaghetti up here, down into that sound until finally, this all sort of says, okay, yes, that's the note we're heading for. It's like a, it's just like giving order to all of this motion, giving a sense of, of control to all this this sort of thing that's spinning out on top of it. It's really a cool effect, and I'll point out that pedal point when we get to it. Otherwise, at this point, I'd say, it's late in the, in the day, let's just enjoy it, except for those couple little things. Uh, subject, <coughs> counter subject, 
when there's no melody playing, it's called an episode, but you don't really need to know. This is the guy's name is Clark. Yeah, we want to see this too. I'll turn it. Too loud again, right? Thanks, Jerry.